Welcome to Thrivecast, uh, a community podcast series where we are meeting uh, growth and engineering leaders from all over the world, practicing the very art of growth and monetization. Uh, with uh, with me, I have uh, Kshitish Ingle uh, from Bombay, and uh, you know he's called a rich career. Uh, you know he's he's worked in at marketing at Ogilvy, uh, Truecaller, uh, MR, Netcore, and now working as a growth consultant, like you know for many many companies. Uh, Kshitish, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Gururaj. Thank you so much for inviting me over. Uh, it's it's wonderful to be a part of this, you know. Uh, when I first heard about this, it was very interesting for me. So oh, I absolutely. So it's, a, it's our pleasure. So, Kshitish, you have a, had a wonderful career. Uh, you know, uh, could you tell us a little bit about your, your career? How did you go about, you know, and how did you go about getting into growth? Uh, tell us your journey. Uh, as you as you stitched upon various career ladders and getting to growth consulting. Sure. So I started off uh, with advertising at Ogilvy because uh, what better way to start off your career after doing computer science, right? So uh, I sure. I got into advertising and then uh, after that, uh, so so my career progression usually was uh, a, more of a problem solving process continuously so i saw problems when i was doing media planning at ogilvy in terms of uh, the campaign management so i got into digital marketing at uh, wonder chef at uh, some of the other companies i was working at on the digital marketing part i found problems in product so i went into product marketing so to say but uh, eventually into product management and uh, then uh, after that, it so happened that I was very uh, drawn towards the growth levers of what make a good product. And uh, I decided that, uh, you know, it would be best to progress in that direction. And uh, I've been going into a deep dive ever since, I think probably like the last three, four years. And uh, then like working in terms of product growth for certain companies, consulting them on various challenges that they face. That's wonderful. Uh, you know, from an engineering background to marketing to growth consulting, that's that's uh, that's a wonderful journey. Uh, tell us a little about, you know, as you're approaching, you know, these companies and, and consulting, uh, consulting them, what stages are they? Uh, have they already achieved product market fit when they call you in? Uh, and uh, tell us more about, you know, the conditions before you join them what are the challenges at that time and why are they you know reaching out to people like you so 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 some of the so i have a few larger clients you know so to say who are series d series e level in terms of their growth and funding so obviously they have found product market fit and they are looking to work on various growth challenges that uh, their internal teams are not really able to give bandwidth to so that is one kind of client that we have and uh, another would be a lot of them would be pre-product market fit you know a uh, lot of great ideas make for good product hunt launch pages but everyone is trying to figure out if you know if that business is going to make money so uh, these are the two primarily the two categories that i'm working with and uh, there are a few uh, now there are a few series a funded startups uh, which are on the brink of finding product market fit or all, already have found. It. So it's a very varied buffet of, or, you know, different kind of growth challenges with these three kinds of clients. So they are in the survival mode and they bring you, um, bring you to, you know, pull them out from the survival mode, get right. into uh, kind of a galvanized growth position. Uh, so, I th- you know, so have they usually reached product market fit, you know, in maybe in your terms, could you describe what are you seeing, uh, you know, how would you define a product market fit for companies like these, especially, you know, if they've gotten to series A or series B, uh, where do you see, you know, what's the, what's the line that tells them, what's the event that tells them that, hey, now they have a product market fit. Now let's go into a GTM fit. Right. So I think in a, in a B2B context, uh, net recurring revenue 
above a certain percentage uh, again that depends on the kind of industry that they operate in you know the kind of solution that they are providing uh, for b2c it's usually your uh, so i think i think this is very overdone but you know your cac to oh, ltv oh, ratios uh, things like that but again we also need to incorporate uh, retention costs as well so um, i think i think you do arrive at a formula based on your understanding of what the market is but uh, yeah uh, it's mostly uh, related to what is the replenishment rate you know in terms of money that you're spending and money that you're making interesting so um, so you help them understand about you know uh, what is cac and how do they how do they you know operate it uh and so on so forth. So that's that's great. So Maybe that I, starts off the sorry. sorry go ahead. I, I I think I think they already understand these metrics pretty well. It's it's just about combining what is relevant for them. So um maybe maybe we'll let's start with the with the broader conversation, right? So you've now you've worked in uh, uh at least about four or five, you've consulted with four or five, you know, mid sized to large size uh, startups. Yeah. uh could you could you maybe describe you know what's the general trends in the market when it comes to growth what are your observations uh, especially you know really short topic you know what is a growth stack that looks like so when you come in you know uh, at, at these companies and of course you might have a discovery phase and many other things but uh, typically you know uh, what are the things that you observe from that particular company how do you know to get the pulse of that particular company you know could you tell us a little more about maybe the broader industry trends as well as how do you bring that broader industry trends and, and apply them to the to the consulting uh, startups that you work with right so um, so i I'll, i'll start with b2b first because uh, both of them are very different in their approach in b2b i have seen that there is a lot of depth in terms of one growth stack that you know a company chooses to operate on so be it a hubspot or a marketo or any any tool that they have picked up uh, there usually seems to be an understanding of the business around the tool that they have chosen to operate on you know it's it's unfortunately it's not the other way around so a lot of uh, team members are stuck up on what tool they are using and how they can implement solutions based on the tool that they are using so i i found this to be a very common problem and uh, in the b2c context uh, it's it's about we have x number of tools how do we operate them together so yeah, so, so stitching uh, you know so what you're saying is when you go to these companies especially with b2b you know um, they start off with typically you know maybe a marketing automation tool yeah uh, and uh, and is is that what you see mostly you know they have they are mostly marketing and sales led and then now you're yes, trying to help them because uh, sorry uh... yeah so they are mostly marketing and sales led right and you help them to figure out how do you optimize on the direction that they are already going or do you help right. them see a different path as well i mean these days product um, led is becoming a buzz so you help them coach them on hey these are different techniques in the market tell us tell us a little more about as you are approaching this particular startup you know uh, right. their mindset their challenges their stacks that they have and how do you help you know change you know or maybe even optimize any of that right so my first task with most of the founders that i worked with in a b2b context is uh i need to take them out of the marketing funnel you know uh we need to help them to be able to see that there is so much more beyond the marketing funnel as well like you know uh although i agree that you know converting like getting prospects converting them into uh you know marketing qualified sales qualified leads is important and then communicating your product benefits all of that is important but there's there's so many other growth loops around it to make that happen and to make that process a lot more simpler so for example when you look at only acquisition uh, you know you have your content loops which help make a more educated user approach you 
uh, you have more contextual stuff that you can provide to them. Uh, when you look at uh, your paid ad loops, for example, uh, a lot of them do not focus on the uh, retention aspect. You know, where uh, if people have done certain actions which mean something to you, uh, they are not brought back in terms of remarketing, in terms of uh, increasing engagement on your product so that they can eventually convert, at least, you know, give them that chance. And uh, the third loop, which is mostly missing, is your uh, uh, advocacy loop, I would say. You know, hmm. so if having having used this product, give me five different ways to share my joy with other people. You know, so that is that is definitely missing in a lot of products, right? So uh, my focus is to help uh, founders or f- help companies build this out, so that you can get more organic uh, bang for your buck, so to say. So we invest in systems which can help, uh, you know, which can run without money being put into it. Uh, you create a conducive environment for users to do certain actions, you know, and give them merit points for those actions. And then you have like a scoring system, which is full of moments of delight plus uh, mm-hmm. moments of despair. You know, you see what are the plus moments, you see what are the minus moments and you keep continuing and refining and fine tuning that user journey based on that. So my focus is usually on helping founders, uh, you know, take a look at these loops, for example, and, you know, uh, also showcase to them what can be achieved if we execute these properly. So interesting. What what you're saying is, if I summarize it, uh, what you're saying is, you help them, you coach them to understand a funnel is not the only way. You know, as we move forward, loops are a better way for you to judge uh, and, you know, grow your business. Uh, Tell me maybe if you could uh, describe maybe a simple case study or maybe you work with, you know, a specific company, Uh, you know, is it very difficult for them to, uh, is it very difficult for you to change their mindset that funnels are not the only thing, you know? I mean, it's just ingrained in people's head that marketing and sales, if you put more dollars into that, you know, you might have more revenue over a period of time. So, you know, is that what it is? And is that what you're fighting generally with? Or is that the tools, the stack that you're fighting with? What's what's the primary challenge? So, so unfortunately, a lot of the tools are built around funnels, right? Currently. Mm-hmm. So, um, and it's, it's going to be very difficult to tell people uh, that you know hey look there is a new concept or or there's a different concept called a loop Uh, because if you're not able to visualize it then it becomes really difficult so my uh, aim in the beginning is to help people realize what is happening and you know help them reimagine that this can be looked at as a loop as well Uh, these could be different funnels put together different actions happening together but you try to look at them as, you know, one is providing fuel for the other, the other one then so the, uh, you know, further boosts another action. So once you start looking at these things in that particular manner, uh, I think it, it does take a little time, but uh, eventually like a lot of people are able to see that. And, uh, you know, uh, then once they see that in action and once they see that, you know, how the different uh, steps of this entire loop are coming together, uh, they become more interested in what other loops that, you know, they can discover and uh, what are the other loops that they can invest their time and money. In. So, so I'm guessing this, this would involve a lot of data collection, isn't it? You know, this would, uh, I mean, a funnel kind of a data is a very... Maybe you can generate it from a HubSpot or, you know, uh, or maybe even an Excel sheet that, hey, these are the number of leads you have. This is what the conversion rate. How do you take it from there to help them understand uh, what is a loop? You know, you know, do you have to go craft out a, a visual way of presenting this information to them? Uh, you know, tell, tell us a little more about, you know, I'm sure our listeners on the, on the podcast 
might also be wondering how do you go from funnel to loops you know that's a very big change uh right. you know in mindsets in tooling you know in the way that people operate as well right so we go about by defining certain actions which are consequential in nature you know i do action a and it leads to event b so uh, these again like are one to many connections in a lot of cases uh what you do is uh, you look at the user journey and you decide that you you reduce the number of outcomes that are possible in that way uh, i can then finally pin down that event uh, sorry action a is leading to event b and then you know uh, events uh, action c is leading to event d but event b and action c are related with each other in some ways so once that starts to happen and obviously it's an engineered approach because if i currently work in the uh, you know the earlier loops or sorry in the earlier funnel uh, setup then it will be very difficult for me to pinpoint this so it's an engineered approach where you uh, have certain only certain number of consequences for action a and then based on that you go on to optimize for the next set of actions and uh, usually uh, there are you will see like there is a clear pattern emerging of about 3 to 4 actions which help fuel each other and uh, the most important but the most challenging aspect is tying down action uh, the last action to the first event which was your fuel in the first place so interesting uh... so could you recommend maybe some tools that you find in the market you know to help uh, maybe tools technologies products you know if you will uh that help you kind of establish this base on looking at this particular action to reaction cause to effect you know kind of a mechanism that you've seen in the market so honestly i don't use any tools for this it's it's more of uh, you know drawing out what are the actions of your business what are the events of your business uh i have certain uh, templates and structures so i would also suggest uh, anyone who is listening to us to look at uh, reforge uh, so you know reforge has a bunch of beautiful templates uh, and those were really helpful for me early in my career uh, so i think those those templates are no brainer in terms of you know how you can put things and information together obviously i have my own twists on them now Uh, you know because as you keep learning you find certain frameworks more useful as opposed to others so um, yeah i just put them down probably take up a miro board or a collaborative whiteboarding tool uh, sit down with different stakeholders see what they are interested in and then suggest loops based on what they would be wanting to work on super maybe why don't we uh, try out um maybe is a simple rapid fire kind of a question you know and sure. uh, uh and the answers would probably be in the in the bucket of must have or nice to have right so we can probably right. you know calibrate this um like for example you said you know funnel um nice to have now uh, but yeah. loops must so have is- right so something of that sort yes. okay so uh let's start with maybe the top of the things that people usually think about especially in the the founders and the growth managers seo is it a must have or a nice to have it's a must have no question must answer. have yes uh product analytics you know meaning helping them understand how customers or users are using their product is it a must have or nice to have so this would depend on the size of the company where uh, because i i see a lot of smaller companies delving very deep into product analytics uh, they don't need to at that point mm-hmm. uh, at that point they should be more concerned with if their product really works for the market uh, you know do they have paying customers i think those are the things that they need to worry about at that point but as the company grows you know as you run out of ways to grow uh, product analytics becomes more and more increasingly uh, important because that then gives you those opportunities those uh, 
you know different loopholes that you didn't probably spot earlier so what you're saying is small startups need not worry about product analytics they oh, focus on right. paid you know paid customers you know as they grow bigger you know deploy product analytics to really understand your customer usage and then drive yeah but but keep collecting data from the beginning uh, yeah that is important got it have historical Now, data yeah let's go to the next question uh, marketing qualified leads must have or nice to have especially in the b2b world in the b2b world i think it would be a nice to have nice to have yeah uh, that's Because... that's very different right uh, you know i think you're coming with a mindset that you know that's a very funnel oriented approach right yeah. uh, and the conversion rates must be very very small which yeah. is where don't spend a lot of lot of time and energy towards mqls uh, that's been interesting maybe so, subsequent question I... to that Okay. Uh, product led growth versus sales led growth uh, is product led growth must have in the beginning of the startups or what do you see out there in the market is it mostly sales led growth how do you say product led so growth I, must have okay uh, irrespective of this a good product will sell itself right so i think uh, first focus on building a good product and uh, then depending on what kind of growth strategy you have in place you can choose product led growth or sales led growth so if you want to aggressively expand in a market and you know capture your piece of the pie go for sales led growth but then sustain it with product led growth okay hey, maybe uh, to describe that a little more let's say if, it, if there's a startup which is before product market fit hiring a sales uh you know a, a sales rep could be a sales engineer or a, or an ae must have or nice to have this is before product market fit that's definitely nice to have okay having a product that sells itself meaning allowing users to automatically discover sign up you know to the product try it out you know mostly like the you know the, the plg kind of motions must have or nice to have I think that is must have. That is must have now. Okay. Yeah. Hiring so, a growth manager. Uh, I I also have some context to this to your previous please, two please questions. Please do. Please do. Because uh, it also depends on what stage of the funding cycle you're looking at. You know, uh, do you need to convince your investors that you know enough about what you're building? So uh, it's an added function uh, related to the questions that they might be wanting to answer. Oh, interesting. I didn't. Uh, I didn't realize that. So, what you're saying is, uh, to help your investors understand whether your business is growing or not. You, you know, are you seeing there is a trend in the market that startups go invest in PLG to really to attract investors and not to attract the customers? I mean, that's vividly very different than you know. Describe more. I'm. 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 Okay, you're going to make me spill more beans. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so the thing is, uh, PLG definitely for users, you know, but uh, everyone needs to present a picture that they are working on PLG, even if they are not. Uh, and PLG needs the person to be patient, right? Which is drastically opposite to uh, what investors are looking at. So uh, again, like there is this uh, template PLG motions in place where you just bring your product. you know uh, you look at certain uh, actions best practices that are happening apply it to your product or service and uh, then move on from there because um, so so i think it's the equivalent of adding generator ai to your product you know that is what is happening now so need to be very careful of these two things now because there's always going to be some trend or the other that's going to come and uh, you know make you think about it at least even if you're not bothered by it so yeah uh, plg done correctly raising funding is also difficult in these times so what hey. what sets you apart from everyone else is something that that is going to be looked at right in some way yeah i guess you know uh, getting to investment is also an event for the found, founders and uh, the leadership team so maybe 
you know, their way of describing that, hey, we would be product led, you know, gets them a higher valuation. We will have generative AI, will have a higher valuation. That's interesting. You know, it looks like it's uh, still a checkbox. It's not yet, you know, in the DNA that uh, that that really leads to, you know, you know, growth and you know higher valuations over time. One last yeah. question: in the rapid fire um, experimentation. You know, um, and maybe at a very broader scale. You know, yeah. allowing yourself to change your mind. You know, to change your way of thinking based on what you look at the data. Is that a must have or a nice to have, especially in the early stages? So I think you're going to be very bored with my answer, but my answer is going to be the same. Like, you know, at early stages, uh, find your product market fit. At later stages, experiment, like have this one team, have a very small team, uh, maybe a subsection of the growth team. So the growth team is looking at the loops and ensuring that they are running fine. But uh, you have like certain pe- people who experiment at every point in time, you know, and those people could keep changing. So let's say if I'm in the acquisition function, uh, I could be working on an acquisition experiment. Uh, given that my retention, given that my other loops are working fine. So, you know, we can keep trading places. You can probably work on the retention experiment once I'm settling up the acquisition loop or you know i'm very confident about the paid loop so things like that there should be definitely some amount of experimentation but uh it again like the the company should have that kind of bandwidth to experiment and early experimentation is not at all recommended maybe that's why people employ you know uh people like you you know founders probably are looking for someone like you you help them uh stabilize their basics, you know, and go from there. So compliments to you, you know, and, and the entire community around, around the practitioners. So at this moment, let's maybe let's wrap up. So one last thing that you could recommend, uh, maybe, you know, uh, an early stage who is not, uh, who's looking to grow, but they are around the PMF journey. What would you, what would you advise them? Okay. Um, I think first would be like focus on building a, a good basic robust product. You know, by that I mean not not get too invested in what the colors of your website are or what your brand looks like, things like that. Uh, just just be focused on what users are going to do once they come to your website or once they come to your app. Uh, see on what are the meaningful actions that they will. Uh, do by themselves or need to be prodded into performing once you figure out those uh, make sure that getting to those actions is enjoyable right because a lot of times we see people get frustrated to get to do those actions so uh, yeah make those actions enjoyable Uh, then give them outcomes along with a cookie in the sense that you give them what they expect but you also give them what they would not have expected. Uh, Based on that, have good pricing plans uh, because a self-activated product is going to take you places, you know. You don't need to invest in sales and support teams early on. So uh, as much as possible, if they're able to experience the entire user journey by themselves, I think you have a winning product. now that's, a, that's a sage advice that's a sage advice yeah. Yeah. Uh, i think to summarize it uh, invest in your product make it uh, bring value more to your end users and end customers before you figure out that you need to grow so i think survival instincts should kick in at that time yeah. uh, again uh, you know this is it's a pleasure uh, Kritish. we will we have run out of time but you know it's always a pleasure to have a conversation with you uh, and I think to listeners, as you can tell, growth consultants like Shritis are rare to find. You know, you they, they bring they bring you down to the basics and get you to the, the very fundamental nature of how do you build products. You know, from from ground up. Thank you, thank you, Shritis, for you know, for being here. And to our listeners, you know, please chime in. Uh, one last question, Shritis: How do people yeah. reach out to you? You know, do you have yeah. a 
i am working on my portfolio right now so you can actually reach out to me on my mail it's mail at ingle.work mail at so, ingle so we can have it uh, in in our show notes there yes and soon my website ingle.work will also be live so right now it's just a you know a standby page uh, i am working on my case studies so you'll be able to see it soon absolutely a pleasure thank you so much shitish and uh, take care and best of luck for your Uh, for all the startups that you have been working with and uh, and for your career okay, take care thank you thank you so much